Chapter Thirteen of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume One: The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Monsieur Bonacieux. There was in all this, as may have been observed, one personage concerned of whom, notwithstanding his precarious position, we have appeared to take but very little notice. This personage was Monsieur Bonacieux the respectable martyr of the political and amorous intrigues which entangled themselves so nicely together at this gallant and chivalric period. Fortunately, the reader may remember, or may not remember, fortunately, we have promised not to lose sight of him. The officers who arrested him conducted him straight to the Bastille, where he passed trembling before a party of soldiers who were loading their muskets. Thence, introduced into a half-subterranean gallery, he became, on the part of those who had brought him, the object of the grossest insults and the harshest treatment. The officers perceived that they had not to deal with a gentleman, and they treated him like a very peasant. At the end of half an hour or thereabouts, a clerk came to put an end to his tortures, but not to his anxiety, by giving the order to conduct M. Bonacieux to the chamber of examination. Ordinarily, Prisoners were interrogated in their cells, but they did not do so with M. Bonacieux. Two guards attended the mercer who made him traverse a court and enter a corridor in which were three sentinels, opened a door, and pushed him unceremoniously into a low room, where the only furniture was a table, a chair, and a commissary. The commissary was seated in the chair and was writing at the table. The two guards led the prisoner toward the table, and upon a sign from the commissary, drew back so far as to be unable to hear anything. The commissary, who had till this time held his head down over his papers, looked up to see what sort of person he had to do with. This commissary was a man of very repulsive mien, with a pointed nose, with yellow and salient cheekbones, with eyes small but keen and penetrating, and an expression of countenance resembling at once the polecat and the fox. His head, supported by a long and flexible neck, issued from his large black robe, balancing itself with the motion very much like that of the tortoise thrusting his head out of his shell. He began by asking M. Bonacieux his name, age, condition, and abode. The accused replied that his name was Jacques Michel Bonacieux, that he was fifty-one years old, a retired mercer, and lived Rue de Fossilleurs, number 14. The commissary then, instead of continuing to interrogate him, made him a long speech upon the danger there is for an obscure citizen to meddle with public matters. He complicated his exordium by an exposition in which he painted the power and the deeds of the cardinal, that incomparable minister, that conqueror of past ministers, that example for ministers to come, deeds and power which none could thwart with impunity. After this second part of his discourse, fixing his hawk's eye upon poor Bonacieux, he bade him reflect upon the gravity of his situation. The reflections of the mercer were already made. He cursed the instant when M. Laporte formed the idea of marrying him to his goddaughter, and particularly the moment when that goddaughter had been received as lady of the linen to her majesty. At bottom, the character of M. Bonacieux was one of profound selfishness, mixed with sordid avarice, the whole seasoned with extreme cowardice. The love with which his young wife had inspired him was a secondary sentiment, and was not strong enough to contend with the primitive feelings we have just enumerated. Bonacieux, indeed, reflected on what had just been said to him. "'But, Monsieur Commissary,' said he calmly, "'believe that I know and appreciate more than anybody "'the merits of the incomparable eminence "'by whom we have the honor to be governed.' "'Indeed?' asked the commissary with an air of doubt. "'If that is really so, how came you in the Bastille?' "'How I came there, or rather why I am there?' replied Bonacieux. That is entirely impossible for me to tell you, because I don't know myself, but to a certainty it is not for having, knowingly at the least, 
disobliged monsieur the cardinal you must nevertheless have committed a crime since you are here and are accused of high treason of high treason cried bonafoux terrified of high treason how is it possible for a poor mercer who detests huguenots and who abhors spaniards to be accused of high treason uh, consider monsieur the thing is absolutely impossible monsieur bonacieux said the commissary looking at the accused as if his little eyes had the faculty of reading to the very depths of hearts you have a wife yes monsieur replied the mercer in a tremble feeling that it was at this point affairs were likely to become perplexing that is to say i had one what you had one what have you done with her then if you have her no longer they have abducted her monsieur they have abducted her ah bonacieux inferred from this ah that the affair grew more and more intricate they have abducted her added the commissary and do you know the man who has committed this deed i think i know him who is he remember that i affirm nothing monsieur the commissary and that i only suspect whom do you suspect come answer freely monsieur bonacieux was in the greatest perplexity possible had he better deny everything or tell everything by denying all it might be suspected that he must know too much to avow by confessing all he might prove his good will he decided then to tell all i suspect said he a tall dark man of lofty carriage who has the air of a great lord he has followed us several times as i think when i have waited for my wife at the wicket of the louvre to escort her home the commissary now appeared to experience a little uneasiness and his name said he oh as to his name i know nothing about it but if i were ever to meet him i should recognize him in an instant i will answer for it were he among a thousand persons the face of the commissary grew still darker you should recognize him among a thousand say you continued he that is to say cried bonacieux who saw he had taken a false step that is to say uh... you have answered that you should recognize him said the commissary that is all very well and enough for today before we proceed further someone must be informed that you know the ravisher of your wife but i have not told you that i know him cried bonacieux in despair i told you on the contrary take away the prisoner said the commissary to the two guards where must we place him demanded the chief in a dungeon which a good lord in the first one handy provided that it is safe said the commissary with an indifference which penetrated poor bonacieux with horror alas alas said he to himself misfortune is over my head my wife must have committed some frightful crime they believe me her accomplice and will punish me with her she must have spoken she must have confessed everything a woman is so weak a dungeon the first he comes to that's it a night is soon past and tomorrow to the wheel to the gallows oh my god my god have pity on me without listening the least in the world to the lamentations of monsieur bonacieux 
lamentations to which, besides, they must have been pretty well accustomed. The two guards took the prisoner each by an arm and led him away, while the commissary wrote a letter in haste and dispatched it by an officer in waiting. Bonacieux could not close his eyes, not because his dungeon was so very disagreeable, but because his uneasiness was so great. He sat all night on his stool, starting at the least noise, and when the first rays of the sun penetrated into his chamber, the dawn itself appeared to him to have taken funereal tints. All at once he heard his bolts drawn and made a terrified bound. He believed they were come to conduct him to the scaffold, so that when he saw merely and simply, instead of the executioner he expected, only his commissary of the preceding evening, attended by his clerk, he was ready to embrace them both. "'Your affair has become more complicated since yesterday evening, my good man, and I advise you to tell the whole truth, for your repentance alone can remove the anger of the cardinal.' "'Why, I am ready to tell everything,' cried Bonacieux. "'At least all that I know. Interrogate me, I entreat you.' "'Where is your wife in the first place?' "'Why, did I not tell you she had been stolen from me?' "'Yes, but yesterday at five o'clock in the afternoon, thanks to you, she escaped.' "'My wife escaped?' cried Bonacieux. "'Oh, unfortunate creature! Monsieur, if she has escaped, it is not my fault.' I swear. What business had you then to go into the chamber of Monsieur d'Artagnan, your neighbor, with whom you had a long conference during the day? Ah, yes, Monsieur Commissary, yes, that is true, and I confess that I was in the wrong. I did go to Monsieur d'Artagnan's. What was the aim of that visit? to beg him to assist me in finding my wife. I believed I had a right to endeavor to find her. I was deceived, as it appears, and I ask your pardon. And what did Monsieur d'Artagnan reply? Monsieur d'Artagnan promised me his assistance, but I soon found out that he was betraying me. You impose upon justice. Monsieur d'Artagnan made a compact with you, and in virtue of that compact put to flight the police, who had arrested your wife, and has placed her beyond reach. Monsieur d'Artagnan has abducted my wife? Come now, what are you telling me? Fortunately, Monsieur d'Artagnan is in our hands, and you shall be confronted with him. "'By my faith, I ask no better,' cried Bonacieux. "'I shall not be sorry to see the face of an acquaintance.' "'Bring in Monsieur d'Artagnan,' said the commissary to the guards. The two guards led in Athos. "'Monsieur d'Artagnan,' said the commissary, addressing Athos, "'declare all that passed yesterday between you and Monsieur.' But, cried Bonacieux, this is not Monsieur d'Artagnan whom you show me. What? Not Monsieur d'Artagnan? exclaimed the commissary. Not the least in the world, replied Bonacieux. What is this gentleman's name? asked the commissary. I cannot tell you. I don't know him. How? You don't know him? No. Did you ever see him? Y yes, I have seen him, but I don't know what he calls himself. Your name, replied the commissary. Athos, replied the musketeer. But that is not a man's name. That is the name of a mountain, cried the poor questioner who began to lose his head. "'That is my name,' said Athos quietly. 
But you said that your name was D'Artagnan. Who? I? Yes, you. Somebody said to me, you are Monsieur D'Artagnan. I answered, you think so? My guards exclaimed that they were sure of it. I did not wish to contradict them. Besides, I might be deceived. Monsieur, you insult the majesty of justice. Not at all, said Athos calmly. You are Monsieur d'Artagnan. You see, monsieur, that you say it again. But I tell you, monsieur commissary, cried Bonacieux in his turn, there is not the least doubt about the matter. Monsieur d'Artagnan is my tenant, although he does not pay me my rent, and even better on that account I ought to know him. Monsieur d'Artagnan is a young man, scarcely nineteen or twenty, and this gentleman must be thirty at least. Monsieur d'Artagnan is in Monsieur Dessessart's guards, and this gentleman is in the company of Monsieur de Treville's musketeers. Look at his uniform, Monsieur Commissary. Look at his uniform. That's true, murmured the commissary. Pardieu, that's true. At this moment the door was opened quickly, and a messenger introduced by one of the gatekeepers of the Bastille gave a letter to the commissary. How oh, unhappy woman, cried the commissary. How? What do you say? Of whom do you speak? It is not of my wife, I hope. On the contrary, it is of her. Yours is a pretty business. But, said the agitated mercer, do me the pleasure, monsieur, to tell me how my own proper affair can become worse by anything my wife does while I am in prison. Because that which she does is part of a plan concerted between you of an infernal plan i swear to you monsieur commissary that you are in the profoundest error that i know nothing in the world about what my wife had to do that i am entirely a stranger to what she has done and that if she has committed any follies i renounce her i abjure her i curse her bah said athos to the commissary if you have no more need of me, send me somewhere. Your Monsieur Bonacieux is very tiresome. The commissary designated by the same gesture Athos and Bonacieux. Let them be guarded more closely than ever. And yet, said Athos with his habitual calmness, if it be Monsieur d'Artagnan whom is concerned in the matter, I do not perceive how I can take his place. Do as I bade you, cried the commissary, and preserve absolute secrecy, you understand? Athos shrugged his shoulders and followed his guards silently while Monsieur Bonacieux uttered lamentations enough to break the heart of a tiger. They locked the mercer in the same dungeon where he had passed the night and left him to himself during the day. Bonacieux wept all day like a true mercer, not being at all a military man, as he himself informed us. In the evening, about nine o'clock, at the moment he had made up his mind to go to bed, he heard steps in the corridor. These steps drew near to his dungeon, where the door was thrown open and the guards appeared. "'Follow me,' said an officer who came up behind the guards. "'Follow you!' cried Bonacieux. "'Follow you at this hour? Where, my God?' where we have orders to lead you. But that is not an answer. It is nevertheless the one we can give. Oh, my God, my God, murmured the poor mercer. Now, indeed, I am lost. And he followed the guards who came for him, mechanically and without resistance. He passed along the same corridor as before, crossed one court, then a second side of a building, at length, at the gate of the entrance court, he found a carriage surrounded by four guards on horseback. They made him enter this carriage. The officer placed himself by his side. The door was locked, and they were left in a rolling prison. The carriage was put in motion as slowly as a funeral car. 
Through the closely fastened windows, the prisoner could perceive the houses and the pavement. That was all. But true Parisian as he was, Bonacieux could recognize every street by the milestones, the signs, and the lamps. At the moment of arriving at St. Paul, the spot where such as were condemned at the Bastille were executed, he was near fainting and crossed himself twice. He thought the carriage was about to stop there. The carriage, however, passed on. Farther on, a still greater terror seized him on passing by the cemetery of St. Jean, where state criminals were buried. One thing, however, reassured him. He remembered that before they were buried, their heads were generally cut off, and he felt that his head was still on his shoulders. But when he saw the carriage take the way to La Greve, when he perceived the pointed roof of the Hôtel de Ville, and the carriage passed under the arcade, he believed it was over with him. He wished to confess to the officer, and upon his refusal uttered some pitiable cries that the officer told him that if he continued to deafen him thus, he should put a gag in his mouth. This measure somewhat reassured Bonacieux. If they meant to execute him at La Greve, it could scarcely be worth while to gag him as they had nearly reached the place of execution. Indeed, the carriage crossed the fatal spot without stopping. There remained, then, no other place to fear but the traitor's cross. The carriage was taking the direct road to it. This time there was no longer any doubt. It was at the traitor's cross that lesser criminals were executed. Bonacieux had flattered himself in believing himself worthy of St. Paul, or of the Place de Greve. It was at the traitor's cross that his journey and his destiny were about to end. He could not yet see that dreadful cross but he felt somehow as if it were coming to meet him. When he was within twenty paces of it, he heard a noise of people, and the carriage stopped. This was more than poor Bonacieux could endure. Depressed as he was by the successive emotions which he had experienced, he uttered a feeble groan which might have been taken for the last sigh of a dying man, and fainted. End of chapter 13 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 14 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Man of Mayung. The crowd was caused, not by the expectation of a man to be hanged, but by the contemplation of a man who was hanged. The carriage, which had been stopped for a minute, resumed its way, passed through the crowd, threaded the Rue Saint-Honore, turned into the Rue des Bonnefants, and stopped before a low door. The door opened. Two guards received Bonacieux in their arms from the officer who supported him. They carried him through an alley, up a flight of stairs, and deposited him in an antechamber. All these movements had been effected mechanically, as far as he was concerned. He had walked as one walks in a dream. He had a glimpse of objects as through a fog. His ears had perceived sounds without comprehending them. He might have been executed at that moment without his making a single gesture in his own defense or uttering a cry to implore mercy. He remained on the bench, with his back leaning against the wall and his hands hanging down, exactly on the spot where the guards placed him. On looking around him, however, as he could perceive no threatening object, as nothing indicated that he ran any real danger, as the bench was comfortably covered with a well-stuffed cushion, as the wall was ornamented with a beautiful Cordova leather, and as large red damask curtains, fastened back by gold clasps, floated before the window, he perceived by degrees that his fear was exaggerated, and he began to turn his head to the right and the left, upward and downward. At this movement, which nobody opposed, he resumed a little courage, and ventured to draw up one leg and then the other. At length, with the help of his two hands, he lifted himself from the bench, and found himself on his feet. At this moment an officer with a pleasant face opened a door, continued to exchange some words with a person in the next chamber, and then came up to the prisoner. "'Is your name Bonacieux?' said he. "'Yes, monsieur officer,' stammered the mercer, more dead than alive. "'At your service.' "'Come in,' 
said the officer. And he moved out of the way to let the mercer pass. The latter obeyed without reply and entered the chamber where he appeared to be expected. It was a large cabinet, close and stifling, with the walls furnished with arms offensive and defensive, and in which there was already a fire, although it was scarcely the end of the month of September. A square table covered with books and papers, upon which was unrolled an immense plan of the city of La Rochelle, occupied the center of the room. Standing before the chimney was a man of middle height, of a haughty, proud mien, with piercing eyes, a large brow, and a thin face, which was made still longer by a royal, or imperial as it is now called, surmounted by a pair of mustaches. Although this man was scarcely thirty-six or thirty-seven years of age, hair, mustaches, and royal all began to be gray. This man, except a sword, had all the appearance of a soldier, and his buff boots, still slightly covered with dust, indicated that he had been on horseback in the course of the day. This man was Armand Jean du Plessis, Cardinal de Richelieu, not such as he is now represented, broken down like an old man, suffering like a martyr, his body bent, his voice failing, buried in a large armchair as in an anticipated tomb, no longer living but by the strength of his genius, and no longer maintaining the struggle with Europe, but by the eternal application of his thoughts, but such as he really was at this period, that is to say, an active and gallant cavalier, already weak of body, but sustained by that moral power which made of him one of the most extraordinary men that ever lived, preparing, after having supported the Duke de Nevers in his duchy of Mantua, after having taken Nimes, Castra, and Ouse, to drive the English from the Isle of Ray and lay siege to La Rochelle. At first sight, nothing denoted the cardinal, and it was impossible for those who did not know his face to guess in whose presence they were. The poor mercer remained standing at the door while the eyes of the personage we have just described were fixed upon him, and appeared to wish to penetrate even into the depths of the past. "'Is this that Bonacieux?' asked he, after a moment of silence. "'Yes, monseigneur,' replied the officer. "'That's well. Give me those papers, and leave us.' The officer took from the table the papers pointed out, gave them to him who asked for them, bowed to the ground, and retired. Bonacieux recognized in these papers his interrogatories of the Bastille, from time to time the man by the chimney raised his eyes from the writings and plunged them like poniards into the heart of the poor mercer. At the end of ten minutes of reading and ten seconds of examination the cardinal was satisfied. "'That head has never conspired,' murmured he. "'But it matters not. We will see.' "'You are accused of high treason,' said the cardinal slowly. "'So I have been told already, Monseigneur,' cried Bonacieux, giving his interrogator the title he had heard the officer give him. "'But I swear to you that I know nothing about it.' The cardinal repressed a smile. "'You have conspired with your wife, with Madame de Chevreuse, and with my lord Duke of Buckingham.' "'Indeed, Monseigneur,' responded the mercer, I have heard her pronounce all those names. And on what occasion? She said that the Cardinal de Richelieu had drawn the Duke of Buckingham to Paris to ruin him and to ruin the Queen. She said that? So cried the Cardinal with violence. Yes, Monseigneur, but I told her she was wrong to talk about such things and that his eminence was incapable. Hold your tongue. You are stupid, replied the cardinal. That's exactly what my wife said, monseigneur. Do you know who carried off your wife? No, monseigneur. You have suspicions, nevertheless? Yes, monseigneur, but... These suspicions appeared to be disagreeable to Monsieur the Commissary, 
and I no longer have them. Your wife has escaped. Did you know that? No, Monseigneur. I learned it since I have been in prison, and that from the conversation of Monsieur the Commissary, an amiable man. The cardinal repressed another smile. Then you are ignorant of what has become of your wife since her flight. Absolutely, Monseigneur, but she has most likely returned to the Louvre. At one o'clock this morning she had not returned. My God, what can have become of her then? We shall know, be assured. Nothing is concealed from the cardinal. The cardinal knows everything. In that case, Monseigneur, do you believe the cardinal will be so kind as to tell me what has become of my wife? Perhaps he may, but you must, in the first place, reveal to the cardinal all you know of your wife's relations with Madame de Chevreuse. But, Monseigneur, I know nothing about them. I have never seen her. When you went to fetch your wife from the Louvre, did you always return directly home? Scarcely ever. She had business to transact with linen drapers, to whose houses I conducted her. And how many were there of these linen drapers? Two, Monseigneur. And where did they live? One in Rue de Vaugirard, the other Rue de la Hop. Did you go into these houses with her? Never, Monseigneur. I waited at the door. And what excuse did she give you for entering all alone? She gave me none. She told me to wait, and I waited. You are a very complacent husband, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux said the cardinal. "'He calls me his dear monsieur,' said the mercer to himself. "'Peste! Matters are going all right.' "'Should you know those doors again?' "'Yes.' "'Do you know the numbers?' "'Yes.' "'What are they?' "'Number twenty-five in the Rue de Vaugirard.' Seventy-five in the Rue de la Harpe. That's well, said the cardinal. At these words he took up a silver bell and rang it. The officer entered. Go, said he in a subdued voice, and find Rochefort. Tell him to come to me immediately if he has returned. The count is here, said the officer, and requests to speak with your eminence instantly. Let him come in, then said the cardinal quickly. The officer sprang out of the apartment with that alacrity which all the servants of the cardinal displayed in obeying him. "'To your eminence,' murmured Bonacieux, rolling his eyes round in astonishment. Five seconds has scarcely elapsed after the disappearance of the officer when the door opened and a new personage entered. "'It is he!' cried Bonacieux. "'He? What he?' asked the cardinal. The man who abducted my wife? The cardinal rang a second time. The officer reappeared. Place this man in the care of his guards again, and let him wait till I send for him. No, Monseigneur, no, it is not he, cried Bonacieux. No, I was deceived. This is quite another man, and does not resemble him at all. Monsieur is, I am sure, an honest man. "'Take away that fool!' said the cardinal. The officer took Bonacieux by the arm and led him into the antechamber where he found his two guards. The newly introduced personage followed Bonacieux impatiently with his eyes till he had gone out, and the moment the door closed, "'They have seen each other,' said he, approaching the cardinal eagerly. "'Who?' asked his eminence. "'He and she.' "'The queen and the duke?' cried Richelieu. "'Yes.' "'Where?' "'At the Louvre.' 
Are you sure of it? Perfectly sure. Who told you of it? Madame de Lannoy, who is devoted to your eminence, as you know. Why did she not let me know sooner? Whether by chance or mistrust, the queen made Madame de Sergy sleep in her chamber and detained her all day. Well, we are beaten. Now let us try to take our revenge. I will assist you with all my heart, Monseigneur. Be assured of that. How did it come about? At half-past twelve, the queen was with her woman. Where? In her bedchamber. Go on. When someone came and brought her a handkerchief from her laundress. And then? The queen immediately exhibited strong emotion, and despite the rouge with which her face was covered, evidently turned pale. And then? And then? She then arose, and with altered voice, Ladies, said she, wait for me ten minutes. I shall soon return. She then opened the door of her alcove and went out. Why did not Madame de Lannoy come and inform you instantly? Nothing was certain. Besides, Her Majesty had said, Ladies, wait for me, and she did not dare to disobey the Queen. How long did the Queen remain out of the chamber? Three quarters of an hour. None of her women accompanied her? Only Donna Estefania. Did she afterward return? Yes, but only to take a little rosewood casket with her cipher upon it, and went out again immediately. And when she finally returned, did she bring that casket with her? No. Does Madame de Lannoy know what was in that casket? Yes, the diamond studs which His Majesty gave the Queen. And she came back without this casket? Yes. Madame de Lannoy, then, is of your opinion that she gave them to Buckingham? She is sure of it. How can she be so? In the course of the day, Madame de Lannoy, in her quality of tirewoman of the Queen, looked for this casket, appeared uneasy at not finding it, and at length asked information of the Queen. And then the Queen? The Queen became exceedingly red and replied that having in the evening broken one of those studs, she had sent it to her goldsmith to be repaired. He must be called upon, and so ascertain if the thing be true or not. I have just been with him. And the goldsmith? The goldsmith has heard nothing of it. Well, well, Rochefort, all is not lost, and perhaps, perhaps everything is for the best. The fact is that I do not doubt your eminence's genius. We'll repair the blunders of his agent. Is that it? That is exactly what I was going to say, if your eminence had let me finish my sentence. Meanwhile, do you know where the Duchess de Chevreuse and the Duke of Buckingham are now concealed? No, Monseigneur. My people could tell me nothing on that head. But... I know. You, Monseigneur? Yes, or at least I guess. They were one in the Rue de Vaugirard, number 25, the other in the Rue de la Harpe, number 75. Does your eminence command that they both be instantly arrested? It will be too late. They will be gone. But still... We can make sure that they are so. Take ten men of my guardsmen, and search the two houses thoroughly. Instantly, Monseigneur. And Rochefort went hastily out of the apartment. The cardinal, being left alone, reflected for an instant, and then rang the bell a third time. The same officer appeared. Bring the prisoner in again, said the cardinal. Monsieur Bonacieux was introduced afresh and upon a sign from the cardinal, the officer retired. "'You have deceived me,' said the cardinal sternly. "'I? 
cried Bonacieux. I deceive your eminence. Your wife, in going to the Rue de Vaugirard and Rue de la Harpe, did not go to find linen drapers. Then why did she go, just God? She went to meet the Duchess de Chevreuse and the Duke of Buckingham. Yes, cried Bonacieux, recalling all his remembrances of the circumstances. Yes, that's it. Your eminence is right. I told my wife several times that it was surprising that linen drapers should live in such houses as those, in houses that had no signs. But she always laughed at me. Ah, Monseigneur, continued Bonacieux, throwing himself at his eminence's feet. Ah, how truly you are the cardinal, the great cardinal, the man of genius whom all the world reveres. The cardinal, however, contemptible might be the triumph gained over so vulgar a being as Bonacieux, did not the less enjoy it for an instant. Then, almost immediately, as if a fresh thought has occurred, a smile played upon his lips, and he said, offering his hand to the mercer, Rise, my friend, you are a worthy man. The cardinal has touched me with his hand. I have touched the hand of the great man, cried Bonacieux. The great man has called me his friend. Yes, my friend, yes, said the cardinal with that paternal tone which he sometimes knew how to assume, but which deceived none who knew him. And as you have been unjustly suspected, well, you must be indemnified. Here, take this purse of a hundred pistoles, and pardon me. I pardon you, Monseigneur said Bonacieux, hesitating to take the purse, fearing doubtless that this pretended gift was but a pleasantry. But you are able to have me arrested, you are able to have me tortured, you are able to have me hanged. You are the master, and I could not have the least word to say. Pardon you, Monseigneur, you cannot mean that. Ah, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux, you are generous in the matter. I see it, and I thank you for it. Thus, then you will take this bag, and you will go away, without being too malcontent. I go away, enchanted. Farewell, then, or rather, au revoir. Whenever Monseigneur wishes, I shall be firmly at the orders of his eminence. That will be often, be assured for I have found your conversation quite charming. Oh, Monseigneur! Au revoir, Monsieur Bonacieux, au revoir. And the cardinal made him a sign with his hand, to which Bonacieux replied by bowing to the ground. He then went out backward, and when he was in the antechamber, the cardinal heard him in his enthusiasm, crying aloud, Long life to the Monseigneur! Long life to his eminence! Long life to the great cardinal! The cardinal listened with a smile to this falsiferous manifestation of the feelings of Monsieur Bonacieux, and then, when Bonacieux's cries were no longer audible, Good, said he, that man would henceforward lay down his life for me. And the cardinal began to examine with the greatest attention the map of La Rochelle, which, as we have said, lay open on the desk, tracing with a pencil the line in which the famous dyke was to pass, which, eighteen months later, shut up the port of the besieged city. As he was in the deepest of his strategic meditations, the door opened, and Rochefort returned. "'Well,' said the cardinal eagerly, rising with a promptitude which proved the degree of importance he attached to the commission with which he had charged the count." Well, said the latter, a young woman of about twenty-six or twenty-eight years of age, and a man from thirty-five to forty, have indeed lodged at the two houses pointed out by your eminence, but the woman left last night, and the man this morning. It was they, cried the cardinal, looking at the clock, and now it is too late to have them pursued. The duchess is at Tours and the duke at Boulogne. It is in London they must be found. 
What are your eminence's orders? Not a word of what has passed. Let the queen remain in perfect security. Let her be ignorant that we know her secret. Let her believe that we are in search of some conspiracy or other. Send me the keeper of the seals, Seigneur. And that man, what has your eminence done with him? What man? asked the cardinal. That Bonacieux. I have done with him all that could be done. I have made him a spy upon his wife. The Comte de Rochefort bowed like a man who acknowledges the superiority of the master as great, and retired. Left alone, the cardinal seated himself again and wrote a letter, which he secured with his special seal. Then he rang. The officer entered for the fourth time. "'Tell Vitray to come to me,' said he, "'and tell him to get ready for a journey.' An instant after, the man he asked for was before him, booted and spurred. Vitray, said he, "'you will go with all speed to London. "'You must not stop an instant on the way. "'You will deliver this letter to Milady. "'Here is an order for two hundred pistoles. "'Call upon my treasurer and get the money. "'You shall have as much again if you are back within six days "'and have executed your commission well.' The messenger, without replying a single word, bowed, took the letter with the order for the two hundred pistoles, and retired. Here is what the letter contained. Milady, be at the first ball at which the Duke of Buckingham shall be present. He will wear on his doublet twelve diamond studs. Get as near to him as you can and cut off two. As soon as these studs shall be in your possession, inform me. End of chapter 14 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 15 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. Translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Men of the Robe and Men of the Sword On the day after these events had taken place, Athos not having reappeared, M. de Treville was informed by D'Artagnan and Porthos of the circumstance. As to Aramis, he had asked for leave of absence for five days, and was gone, it was said, to Rouen on family business. M. de Treville was the father of his soldiers. The lowest or the least known of them, as soon as he assumed the uniform of the company, was as sure of his aid and support as if he had been his own brother. He repaired then instantly to the office of the lieutenant criminel. The officer who commanded the post of the Red Cross was sent for, and by successive inquiries they learned that Athos was then lodged in Fort Leveque. Athos had passed through all the examinations we have seen Bonacieux undergo. We were present at the scene in which the two captives were confronted with each other. Athos, who had till that time said nothing for fear that D'Artagnan, interrupted in his turn, should not have the time necessary, from this moment declared that his name was Athos, and not D'Artagnan. He added that he did not know either Monsieur or Madame Bonacieux, that he had never spoken to the one or the other, that he had come at about ten o'clock in the evening to pay a visit to his friend Monsieur D'Artagnan, but that till that hour he had been at Monsieur de Treville's, where he had dined. Twenty witnesses, added he, could attest the fact and he named several distinguished gentlemen, and among them was Monsieur le Duc de la Tremouille. The second commissary was as much bewildered as the first had been by the simple and firm declaration of the musketeer, upon whom he was anxious to take the revenge which men of the robe like at all times to gain over men of the sword. But the name of Monsieur de Treville and that of Monsieur de la Tremouille commanded a little reflection. Athos was then sent to the cardinal, but unfortunately the cardinal was at the Louvre with the king. It was precisely at this moment that M. de Treville, on leaving the residence of the lieutenant criminel and the governor of Fort Leveque without being able to find Athos, arrived at the palace. As captain of the musketeers, M. de Treville had the right of entry at all times. It is well known how violent the king's prejudices were against the queen, and how carefully those prejudices were kept up by the cardinal, who in affairs of intrigue mistrusted women infinitely more than men. One of the grand causes of this prejudice was the friendship of Anne of Austria for Madame de Chevreuse. 
These two women gave him more uneasiness than the war with Spain, the quarrel with England, or the embarrassment of the finances. In his eyes and to his conviction, Madame de Chevreuse not only served the queen in her political intrigues, but what tormented him still more in her amorous intrigues. At the first word, the cardinal spoke of Madame de Chevreuse, who, though exiled to Tours and believed to be in that city, had come to Paris, remained there five days, and outwitted the police. The king flew into a furious passion. Capricious and unfaithful, the king wished to be called Louis the Just and Louis the Chaste. Posterity will find a difficulty in understanding this character, which history explains only by facts and never by reason. But when the cardinal added that not only Madame de Chevreuse had been in Paris, but still further, that the queen had renewed with her one of those mysterious correspondences, which at that time was named a cabal, when he affirmed that he, the cardinal, was about to unravel the most closely twisted thread of this intrigue, that at the moment of arresting in the very act, with all the proofs about her, the queen's emissary to the exiled duchess, a musketeer had dared to interrupt the course of justice violently by falling sword in hand upon the honest men of the law, charged with investigating impartially the whole affair in order to place it before the eyes of the king. Louis the Thirteenth could not contain himself, and he made a step toward the queen's apartment with that pale and mute indignation which, when it broke out, led this prince to the commission of the most pitiless cruelty. And yet, in all this, the cardinal had not yet said a word about the Duke of Buckingham. At this instant, M. de Treville entered, cool, polite, and in irreproachable costume. Informed of what had passed by the presence of the cardinal and the alteration in the king's countenance, M. de Treville felt himself something like Samson before the Philistines. Louis the Thirteenth had already placed his hand on the knob of the door. At the noise of M. de Treville's entrance, he turned round. "'You arrive in good time, monsieur,' said the king, who, when his passions were raised to a certain point, could not dissemble. "'I have learned some fine things concerning your musketeers.' "'And I,' said Treville coldly, "'I have some pretty things to tell your majesty concerning these gownsmen.' "'What?' said the king with hauteur. "'I have the honor to inform your majesty,' continued M. de Treville in the same tone, "'that a party of procureurs, commissaries, and men of the police, very estimable people, but very inveterate as it appears, against the uniform, have taken upon themselves to arrest in a house, to lead away through the open street, and throw into Fort Leveque all upon an order which they have refused to show me, one of my, or rather, one of yours, musketeers, sire, of irreproachable conduct, of an almost illustrious reputation, and whom your majesty knows favorably, Monsieur Athos. Athos, said the king mechanically, yes, certainly I know that name. Let your majesty remember, said Treville, that monsieur athos is the musketeer who in the annoying duel which you are acquainted with had the misfortune to wound monsieur de cahusac so seriously a propos monseigneur continued treville addressing the cardinal monsieur de cahusac is quite recovered is he not thank you said the cardinal biting his lips with anger Athos, then, went to pay a visit to one of his friends absent at the time, continued Treville, to a young Bernays, a cadet in His Majesty's guards, the company of Monsieur Dessessart, but scarcely had he arrived at his friends and taken up a book while waiting his return, when a mixed crowd of bailiffs and soldiers came and laid siege to the house, broke open several doors. The cardinal made the king a sign which signified— that was on account of the affair about which I spoke to you. We all know that, interrupted the king, for all that was done for our service. Then, said Treville, 
it was also for your majesty's service that one of my musketeers who was innocent has been seized that he has been placed between two guards like a malefactor and that this gallant man who has ten times shed his blood in your majesty's service and is ready to shed it again has been paraded through the midst of an insolent populace bah said the king who had began to be shaken was it so managed monsieur de treville said the cardinal with the greatest phlegm does not tell your majesty that this innocent musketeer this gallant man had only an hour before attacked sword in hand four commissaries of inquiry who were delegated by myself to examine into an affair of the highest importance i defy your eminence to prove it cried treville with his gascon freedom and military frankness for one hour before monsieur athos who i will confide it to your majesty is really a man of the highest quality did me the honor of having dined with me to be conversing in the saloon of my hotel with the duc de la tremoille and the comte de chaloux who happened to be there the king looked at the cardinal a written examination attests it said the cardinal replying aloud to the mute interrogation of his majesty and the ill-treated people who have drawn up the following which i have the honor to present to your majesty and is the written report of the groundsman to be placed in comparison with the word of honor of a swordsman replied treville haughtily come come treville hold your tongue said the king if his eminence entertains any suspicion against one of my musketeers said treville the justice of monsieur the cardinal is so well known that i demand an inquiry in the house in which the judicial inquiry was made continued the impassive cardinal there lodges i believe a young bearnaise a friend of the musketeer your eminence means monsieur d'artagnan i mean a young man whom you patronize monsieur de treville yes your eminence it is the same do you not suspect this young man of having given bad counsel to athos to a man double his age interrupted treville no monseigneur besides d'artagnan passed the evening with me well said the cardinal everybody seems to have passed the evening with you does your eminence doubt my word said treville with a brow flushed with anger no god forbid said the cardinal only at what hour was he with you oh as to that i can speak positively your eminence for as he came in i remarked that it was but half past nine by the clock although i had believed it to be later at what hour did he leave your hotel at half past ten an hour after the event well replied the cardinal who could not for an instant suspect the loyalty of treville and who felt that the victory was escaping him well but athos was taken in the house in the rue de fossoyeur is one friend forbidden to visit another or a musketeer of my company to fraternize with a guard of dessessart's company yes when the house where he fraternizes is suspected that house is suspected treville said the king perhaps you did not know it indeed sire i did not the house may be suspected but i deny that it is so in the part of it inhabited by monsieur d'artagnan for i can affirm sire if i can believe what he says that there does not exist a more devoted servant of your majesty or a more profound admirer of monsieur the cardinal was it not this d'artagnan who wounded jussac one day in that unfortunate encounter which took place near the convent of the calm de chausses asked the king looking at the cardinal who colored with vexation and the next day bernajoux 
Yes, sire, yes, it is the same, and your majesty has a good memory. Come, how shall we decide? said the king. That concerns your majesty more than me, said the cardinal. I should affirm the culpability. And I deny it, said Treville. But his majesty has judges, and these judges will decide. That is best, said the king. Send the case before the judges. It is their business to judge, and they shall judge. Only, replied Treville, it is a sad thing that in the unfortunate times in which we live, the purest life, the most incontestable virtue, cannot exempt a man from infamy and persecution. The army, I will answer for it, will be but little pleased on being exposed to rigorous treatment on account of police affairs. The expression was imprudent, but M. de Treville launched it with knowledge of his cause. He was desirous of an explosion, because in that case the mind throws forth fire, and fire enlightens. "'Police affairs!' cried the king, taking up Treville's words. "'Police affairs! And what do you know about them, monsieur? Meddle with your musketeers, and do not annoy me in this way. It appears, according to your account, that if by mischance a musketeer is arrested, France is in danger. What a noise about a musketeer!' I would arrest ten of them, ventre bleu, a hundred, even all the company, and I would not allow a whisper. From the moment they are suspected by your majesty, said Treville, the musketeers are guilty. Therefore you see me prepared to surrender my sword, for after having accused my soldiers, there can be no doubt that Monsieur the Cardinal will end by accusing me. It is best to constitute myself at once a prisoner with Athos, who is already arrested, and with D'Artagnan, who most probably will be. Yes, gone-headed man, will you have done? said the king. Sire, replied Treville, without lowering his voice in the least, either order my musketeer to be restored to me, or let him be tried. He shall be tried, said the cardinal. Well, so much the better for in that case I shall demand of his majesty permission to plead for him. The king feared an outbreak. If his eminence, said he, did not have personal motives. The cardinal saw what the king was about to say and interrupted him. Pardon me, said he, but the instant your majesty considers me a prejudiced judge, I withdraw. Come, said the king. Will you swear by my father that Athos was at your residence during the event, and that he took no part in it? By your glorious father, and by yourself, whom I love and venerate, above all the world, I swear it. Be so kind as to reflect, sire, said the cardinal. If we release the prisoner thus, we shall never know the truth. Athos may always be found, replied Treville, ready to answer when it shall please the gownsman to interrogate him. He will not desert, monsieur the cardinal, be assured of that. I will answer for him. No, he will not desert, said the king. He can always be found, as Treville says. Besides, added he, lowering his voice and looking with a suppliant air at the cardinal, let us give them apparent security. That is policy. This policy of Louis the Thirteenth made Richelieu smile. Order it as you please, sire. You possess the right of pardon. The right of pardoning only applies to the guilty, said Treville, who was determined to have the last word. And my musketeer is innocent. It is not mercy, then that you are about to accord, sire, it is justice. And he is in the Fort Leveque, said the king. Yes, sire, in solitary confinement, in a dungeon, like the lowest criminal. The devil, murmured the king. What must be done? 
sign an order for his release, and all will be said, replied the cardinal. I believe with your majesty that Monsieur de Treville's guarantee is more than sufficient. Treville bowed very respectfully, with a joy that was not unmixed with fear. He would have preferred an obstinate resistance on the part of the cardinal to this sudden yielding. The king signed the order for release, and Treville carried it away without delay. As he was about to leave the presence, the cardinal gave him a friendly smile and said, A perfect harmony reigns, sire, between the leaders and the soldiers of your musketeers, which must be profitable for the service and honorable to all. He will play me some dog's trick or other, and that immediately, said Treville. One has never the last word with such a man. But let us be quick. The king may change his mind in an hour, and at all events it is more difficult to replace a man in the Fort Levesque or the Bastille who has got out than to keep a prisoner there who is in. Monsieur de Treville made his entrance triumphantly into the Fort Levesque, whence he delivered the musketeer whose peaceful indifference had not for a moment abandoned him. The first time he saw D'Artagnan, "'You have come off well,' said he to him. "'There is your Jussac thrust paid for. "'There still remains that of Bernajou, "'but you must not be too confident.' "'As to the rest, Monsieur de Treville had good reason "'to mistrust the cardinal "'and to think that all was not over, "'for scarcely had the captain of the musketeers "'closed the door after him "'than his eminence said to the king, "'Now that we are at length by ourselves,' We will, if your majesty pleases, converse seriously. Sire, Buckingham has been in Paris five days, and only left this morning. End of section 15. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 16 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In which Monsieur Seigneur, Keeper of the Seals, looks more than once for the bell. It is impossible to form an idea of the impression these few words made upon Louis the Thirteenth. He grew pale and red alternately and the cardinal saw at once that he had recovered by a single blow all the ground he had lost. "'Buckingham in Paris!' cried he. "'And why does he come?' "'To conspire, no doubt, with your enemies, the Huguenots and the Spaniards.' "'No, but you know, to conspire against my honor with Madame de Chevreuse, Madame de Longueville, and the Cod. Oh, sire, what an idea! The queen is too virtuous, and besides, loves your majesty too well. Woman is weak, monsieur cardinal, said the king, and as to loving me much, I have my own opinion as to that love. I not the less maintain, said the cardinal, that the Duke of Buckingham came to Paris for a project wholly political. And I am sure that he came for quite another purpose, Monsieur Cardinal. But if the Queen be guilty, let her tremble. Indeed, said the Cardinal, whatever repugnance I may have to directing my mind to such a treason, Your Majesty compels me to think of it. Madame de Lannoy, whom, according to Your Majesty's command, I have frequently interrogated, told me this morning that the night before last, her majesty sat up very late, that this morning she wept much, and that she was writing all day. "'That's it!' cried the king. "'To him, no doubt, cardinal. I must have the queen's papers.' "'But how to take them, sire? It seems to me that it is neither your majesty nor myself who can charge himself with such a mission.' "'How did they act with regard to the Maréchal d'Anca? cried the king in the highest state of choler. First her closets were thoroughly searched, and then she herself.' 
the Marechal d'Ancre was no more than the Marechal d'Ancre, a Florentine adventurer, sire, and that was all. While the august spouse of your majesty is Anne of Austria, queen of France, that is to say, one of the greatest princesses in the world. She is not the less guilty, Monsieur Duke. The more she has forgotten the high position in which she was placed, the more degrading is her fall. Besides, I long ago determined to put an end to all these petty intrigues of policy and love. She has near her a certain Laporte. Who, I believe, is the mainspring of all of this, I confess, said the cardinal. You think, then, as I do, that she deceives me, said the king. I believe, and I repeat it to your majesty, that the queen conspires against the power of the king, but... I have not said against his honor. And I, I tell you against both. I tell you the queen does not love me. I tell you she loves another. I tell you she loves that infamous Buckingham. Why did you not have him arrested while in Paris? Arrest the duke? Arrest the prime minister of King Charles I? Think of it, sire. What a scandal! And if the suspicions of your majesty, which I still continue to doubt, should prove to have any foundation, what a terrible disclosure! What a fearful scandal! But, as he exposed himself like a vagabond or a thief, he should have been— Louis the Thirteenth stopped, terrified at what he was about to say, while Richelieu, stretching out his neck— waited uselessly for the word which had died on the lips of the king. He should have been... Nothing, said the king. Nothing. But all the time he was in Paris, you, of course, did not lose sight of him. No, sire. Where did he lodge? Rue de la Harpe, number 75. Where is that? By the side of the Luxembourg. And you are certain that the Queen and he did not see each other? I believe the Queen to have too high a sense of her duty, sire. But they have corresponded. It is to him that the Queen was writing all the day. Monsieur Duke, I must have those letters. Sire, notwithstanding monsieur duke at whatever price it may be i will have them i would however beg your majesty to observe do you then also join in betraying me monsieur cardinal by thus always opposing my will are you also in accord with spain and england with madame de chevreuse and the queen sire replied the cardinal, sighing. I believed myself secure from such a suspicion. Monsieur Cardinal, you have heard me. I will have those letters. There is but one way. What is that? That would be to charge Monsieur de Ségur, the keeper of the seals, with this mission. The matter in enters completely into the duties of the post. Let him be sent for, instantly. He is most likely at my hotel. I requested him to call, and when I came to the Louvre, I left orders, if he came, to desire him to wait. Let him be sent for, instantly. Your Majesty's orders shall be executed. But... But what? But the Queen will perhaps... Refuse to obey. My orders? Yes, if she is ignorant that these orders came from the king. Well, that she may have no doubt on that head, I will go and inform her myself. Your majesty will not forget that I have done everything in my power to prevent a rupture. Yes, duke, 
yes i know you are very indulgent toward the queen too indulgent perhaps we shall have occasion i warn you at some future period to speak of that whenever it shall please your majesty but i shall be always happy and proud sire to sacrifice myself to the harmony which i desire to see reign between you and the queen of france very well cardinal very well but meantime send for monsieur the keeper of the seals i will go to the queen and louis the thirteenth opening the door of communication passed into the corridor which led from his apartments to those of anne of austria the queen was in the midst of her women madame de guitot madame de sable madame de montbazon and madame de guimene in a corner was the spanish companion donna estefania who had followed her from madrid madame guimene was reading aloud and everybody was listening to her with attention with the exception of the queen who had on the contrary desired this reading in order that she might be able while feigning to listen to pursue the thread of her own thoughts these thoughts gilded as they were by a last reflection of love were not the less sad anne of austria deprived of the confidence of her husband pursued by the hatred of the cardinal who could not pardon her for having repulsed a more tender feeling having before her eyes the example of the queen mother whom that hatred had tormented all her life though marie de medicis if the memoirs of the time are to be believed had begun by according to the cardinal that sentiment which anne of austria always refused him anne of austria had seen her most devoted servants fall around her her most intimate confidants her dearest favorites like those unfortunate persons endowed with a fatal gift she brought misfortune upon everything she touched her friendship was a fatal sign which called down persecution madame de chevreuse and madame de bernay were exiled and laporte did not conceal from his mistress that he expected to be arrested every instant it was at the moment when she was plunged in the deepest and darkest of these reflections that the door of the chamber opened and the king entered the reader hushed herself instantly all the ladies rose and there was a profound silence as to the king he made no demonstration of politeness only stopping before the queen madame said he you are about to receive a visit from the chancellor who will communicate certain matters to you with which i have charged him the unfortunate queen who was constantly threatened with divorce exile and trial even turned pale under her rouge and could not refrain from saying but why this visit sire what can the chancellor have to say to me that your majesty could not say yourself the king turned upon his heel without reply and almost at the same instant the captain of the guards m de guiton announced the visit of the chancellor when the chancellor appeared the king had already gone out by another door the chancellor entered half smiling half blushing as we shall probably meet with him again in the course of our history it may be well for our readers to be made at once acquainted with him this chancellor was a pleasant man he was de roche le masle canon of notre dame who had formerly been valet of a bishop who introduced him to his eminence as a perfectly devout man the cardinal trusted him and therein found his advantage there are many stories related of him and among them this after a wild youth he had retired into a convent there to expiate at least for some time the follies of adolescence on entering this holy place the poor penitent was unable to shut the door so close as to prevent the passions he fled from entering with him he was incessantly attacked by them and the superior to whom he had confided this misfortune wishing as much as in him lay to free him from them had advised him in order to conjure away the tempting demon to have recourse to the bell rope and ring with all his might at the denunciating sound the monks would be rendered aware that temptation was besieging a brother and all the community would go to prayers this advice appeared good to the future chancellor he conjured the evil spirit with abundance of prayers offered up by the monks but the devil does not suffer himself to be easily dispossessed from a place in which he has fixed his garrison in proportion as they redoubled the exorcisms he redoubled the temptations 
so that day and night the bell was ringing full swing, announcing the extreme desire for mortification which the penitent experienced. The monks had no longer an instant of repose. By day they did nothing but ascend and descend the steps which led to the chapel. At night, in addition to complines and matins, they were further obliged to leap twenty times out of their beds and prostrate themselves on the floor of their cells. It is not known whether it was the devil who gave way, or the monks who grew tired, but within three months the penitent reappeared in the world with the reputation of being the most terrible possessed that ever existed. On leaving the convent, he entered into the magistracy, becoming president of the place of his uncle, embraced the cardinal's party, which did not prove want of sagacity, became chancellor, served his eminence with zeal and his hatred against the queen mother, and his vengeance against Anne of Austria, stimulated the judges in the affair of Calais, encouraged the attempts of Monsieur de la Fama, chief gamekeeper of France, then at length invested with the entire confidence of the cardinal, a confidence which he had so well earned, he received the singular commission for the execution of which he presented himself in the queen's apartments. The queen was still standing when he entered, but scarcely had she perceived him then, she reseated herself in her armchair, and made a sign to her women to resume their cushions and stools, and with an air of supreme hauteur, said, "'What do you desire, monsieur, and with what object do you present yourself here?' "'To make, madame, in the name of the king, and without prejudice to the respect which I have the honor to owe to your majesty, a close examination into all your papers.' "'How, monsieur, an investigation of my papers? Mine? Truly, this is an indignity.' "'Be kind enough to pardon me, madam, but in this circumstance I am but the instrument which the king employs. Has not his majesty just left you, and has he not himself asked you to prepare for this visit?' "'Search, then, monsieur. I am a criminal, as it appears. Estefania, give up the keys of my drawers and my desks.' For form's sake, the Chancellor paid a visit to the pieces of furniture named, but he well knew that it was not in a piece of furniture that the Queen would place the important letter she had written that day. When the Chancellor had opened and shut twenty times the drawers of the secretaries, it became necessary whatever hesitation he might experience—it became necessary, I say, to come to the conclusion of the affair, that is, to say to search the Queen herself. The Chancellor advanced, therefore, toward Anne of Austria, and said with a very perplexed and embarrassed air, "'And now it remains for me to make the principal examination.' "'What is that?' asked the Queen, who did not understand, or rather was not willing to understand. "'His Majesty is certain that a letter has been written by you during the day.' He knows that it has not yet been sent to its address. This letter is not in your table, nor in your secretary, and yet this letter must be somewhere. "'Would you dare to lift your hand to your queen?' said Anne of Austria, drawing herself up to her full height, and fixing her eyes upon the Chancellor with an expression almost threatening. "'I—' am a faithful subject of the king, madame, and all that his majesty commands I shall do." "'Well, it is true,' said Anne of Austria, "'and the spies of the cardinal have served him faithfully. I have written a letter today. That letter is not yet gone. The letter is here.' And the queen laid her beautiful hand on her bosom. Then. "'Give me that letter, madame,' said the Chancellor. "'I will give it to none but the King, monsieur,' said Anne. "'If the King had desired that the letter should be given to him, madame, "'he would have demanded it of you himself. "'But I repeat to you, I am charged with reclaiming it, "'and if you do not give it up—' 
Well? He has then charged me to take it from you. How? What do you say? That my orders go so far, madame, and that I am authorized to seek for the suspected paper, even on the person of your majesty. What horror! cried the queen. Be kind enough, then, madame, to act more compliantly. The conduct is infamously violent. Do you know that, monsieur? The king commands it, madame. Excuse me. I will not suffer it. No, no, I would rather die, cried the queen, in whom the imperious blood of Spain and Austria began to rise. The chancellor made a profound reverence. Then, with the intention quite patent of not drawing back a foot from the accomplishment of the commission with which he was charged, and as the attendant of an executioner might have done in the chamber of torture, he approached Anne of Austria, from whose eyes at the same instant sprang tears of rage. The queen was, as we have said, of great beauty. The commission might well be called delicate, and the king had reached in his jealousy of Buckingham the point of not being jealous of any one else. Without doubt, the Chancellor Sigur looked about at that moment for the rope of the famous bell, but not finding it, he summoned his resolution and stretched forth his hands toward the place where the Queen had acknowledged the paper was to be found. Anne of Austria took one step backward, became so pale that it might be said she was dying, and leaning with her left hand upon a table behind her to keep herself from falling, she with her right hand drew the paper from her bosom and held it out to the keeper of the seals. "'There, monsieur, there is that letter,' cried the queen with a broken and trembling voice. "'Take it and deliver me from your odious presence.' The chancellor, who on his part trembled with an emotion easily to be conceived, took the letter, bowed to the ground, and retired. The door was scarcely closed upon him when the queen sank, half-fainting into the arms of her women. The chancellor carried the letter to the king without having read a single word of it. The king took it with a trembling hand, looked for the address which was wanting, became very pale, opened it slowly, then seeing by the first words that it was addressed to the king of Spain, he read it rapidly. It was nothing but a plan of attack against the cardinal. The queen pressed her brother and the emperor of Austria to appear to be wounded, as they really were, by the policy of Richelieu, the eternal object of which was the abasement of the house of Austria, to declare war against France, and as a condition of peace to insist upon the dismissal of the cardinal. But as to love, there was not a single word about it in all the letter. The king, quite delighted, inquired if the cardinal was still at the Louvre, he was told that his eminence awaited the orders of his majesty in the business cabinet. The king went straight to him. "'There, duke,' said he, "'you were right, and I was wrong. The whole intrigue is political, and there is not the least question of love in this letter. But, on the other hand, there is abundant question of you.' The cardinal took the letter and read it with the greatest attention. Then, when he had arrived at the end of it, he read it a second time. "'Well, your majesty,' said he, "'you see how far my enemies go. They menace you with two wars if you do not dismiss me. In your place, in truth, sire, I should yield to such powerful instance, and on my part it would be a real happiness to withdraw from public affairs.' "'What say you, duke?' I say, sire, that my health is sinking under these excessive struggles and these never-ending labors. I say that, according to all probability, I shall not be able to undergo the fatigues of the siege of La Rochelle, and that it would be far better that you should appoint there either Monsieur de Conde, Monsieur de Bassopierre, or some valiant gentleman whose business is war, and not me, who am a churchman and who am constantly turned aside from my real vocation to look after matters for which I have no aptitude. You would be happier for it at home, sire, 
and I do not doubt you would be the greater for it abroad. Monsieur Duke, said the king, I understand you. Be satisfied. All who are named in that letter shall be punished as they deserve, even the queen herself. What do you say, sire? God forbid that the queen should suffer the least inconvenience or uneasiness on my account. She has always believed me, sire, to be her enemy, although your majesty can bear witness that I have always taken her part warmly, even against you. Oh, if she betrayed your majesty on the side of your honor, it would be quite another thing, and I should be the first to say, no grace, sire, no grace for the guilty. Happily, there is nothing of the kind, and your majesty has just acquired a new proof of it. That is true, Monsieur Cardinal, said the king, and you were right, as you always are. But the queen, not the less, deserves all my anger. It is you, sire, who have now incurred hers, and even if she were to be seriously offended, I could well understand it. Your majesty has treated her with a severity. It is thus I will always treat my enemies and yours, duke, however high they may be placed, and whatever peril I may incur in acting severely toward them. The queen is my enemy, but is not yours, sire. On the contrary, she is a devoted, submissive, and irreproachable wife. Allow me, then, sire, to intercede for her with your majesty. Let her humble herself, then, and come to me first. On the contrary, sire, set the example. You have committed the first wrong, since it was you who suspected the queen. What? I make the first advances, said the king. Never. Sire, I entreat you to do so. Besides, in what manner can I make advances first? By doing a thing which you know will be agreeable to her. What is that? Give a ball. You know how much the queen loves dancing. I will answer for it. Her resentment will not hold out against such an attention. Monsieur Cardinal, you know that I do not like worldly pleasures. The queen will only be the more grateful to you, and she knows your antipathy for that amusement. Besides, it will be an opportunity for her to wear those beautiful diamonds which you gave her recently on her birthday, and with which she has since had no occasion to adorn herself. "'We shall see, Monsieur Cardinal, we shall see,' said the king, who in his joy at finding the queen guilty of a crime which he cared little about, and innocent of a fault of which he had great dread, was ready to make up all differences with her. "'We shall see.' But, upon my honor, you are too indulgent toward her. Sire, said the cardinal, leave severity to your ministers. Clemency is a royal virtue. Employ it, and you will find that you derive advantage therein. Thereupon the cardinal, hearing the clock strike eleven, bowed low, asking permission of the king to retire, and supplicating him to come to a good understanding with the queen. Anne of Austria who in consequence of the seizure of her letter expected reproaches, was much astonished the next day to see the king make some attempts at reconciliation with her. Her first move was repellent. Her womanly pride and her queenly dignity had both been so cruelly offended that she could not come round at the first advance. But, over-persuaded by the advice of her women, she at last had the appearance of beginning to forget. The king took advantage of this favorable moment to tell her that he had the intention of shortly giving a fete. A fete was so rare a thing for poor Anne of Austria that at this announcement, as the cardinal had predicted, the last trace of her resentment disappeared, if not from her heart, at least from her countenance. She asked upon what day this fete would take place, but the king replied that he must consult the cardinal upon that head. Indeed, every day the king asked the cardinal when this fete should take place, and every day the cardinal, under some pretext, deferred fixing it. Ten days passed away thus. On the eighth day after the scene we have described, the cardinal received a letter with the London stamp, which only contained these lines. I have them, but I am unable to leave London for want of money. 
Send me five hundred pistoles, and four or five days after I have received them, I shall be in Paris. On the same day the cardinal received this letter, the king put his customary question to him. Richelieu counted on his fingers and said to himself, She will arrive, she says, four or five days after having received the money. It will require four or five days for the transmission of the money, four or five days for her to return. That makes ten days. Now, allowing for contrary winds, accidents, and a woman's weaknesses, there are twelve days. "'Well, Monsieur Duke,' said the king, "'have you made your calculations?' "'Yes, sire. Today is the twentieth of September. The aldermen of the city give a fete on the third of October. That will fall in wonderfully well. You will not appear to have gone out of your way to please the queen.' Then the cardinal added, "'Apropos, sire, do not forget to tell Her Majesty the evening before the fete that you should like to see how her diamond studs become her. End of chapter 16 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia